could result in kernel mode code going and overriding that data that's about to go to disk. So it wants to stop corruption from happening, and if it's already started to happen, stop it from continuing. So the thing, its, it's job, its way that it get, uh, gets that to happen is just stopping right away. And it does that by presenting the blue screen to death. Some of the kinds of problems that cause the kernel to give up like that are unhandled exceptions, like ex executing invalid instruction. A driver of the kernel detects that some, there's some big problem with the data structures. They don't look the way it expects them to look. A driver accessing memory at a high interrupt level, pageable memory at a high interrupt level, the famous Urkel not less or equal crash, another very common pro type of problem. Giving up the thread, the, a thread telling the scheduler that it wants to give up the CPU and have another, the scheduler pick another thread when the interrupt request level is too high is another violation of the internal rules of Windows, and that would cause a blue screen as well. And finally, hardware errors, of course. Windows, when they detect, when it detects, detects those kinds of problems, might crash as well. Microsoft has analyzed the kinds of crashes that come into their online crash analysis site and determined by looking at them what the root causes of those blue screens were. And this is a data from about a year ago. Talked to Vince recently, and he indicates that the numbers are about the same today, maybe plus or minus a few percentage points in each category, that roughly 70% of Windows crashes caused by third-party driver code. 15% they can't figure it out because the crashes are so bad that the, the, there's no information there. Roughly 10% caused by hardware issues that include memory problems and disk problems. And roughly 5%, they admit, caused by Microsoft code. I think that's big of them to come out and say, hey, yeah, we're, we're still responsible for some part of this. But they're getting a lot better. The problem that Windows faces, and the reason Windows has for a long time had this reputation of being a buggy operating system, it isn't really the fault of Windows. It's the fault of Windows success. And Windows success means that lots of people are making devices for Windows. That means that lots of people are writing drivers for Windows. Lots of people that probably shouldn't be writing drivers for Windows. If you look at these numbers, they're pretty staggering. And these, again, are about a year old. The numbers are just accelerating as Windows just continues to grow and grow and grow. Over 55,000 unique drivers, 24 brand new drivers, never seen before, released every day. And if you include revised drivers, the numbers are even more impressive. So let's talk about what happens now at the time of a crash. When something in kernel mode detects a problem, it shuts down the machine by calling a function called kebugcheckex. And that function takes five arguments. The first is called the stop code, and that's the component's high-level reason for why it's decided to crash the machine. The other four parameters you have to interpret with respect to what the stop code is. For a particular stop code, the first parameter might mean something. For a different stop code, it might mean something else. KBUGCHEX turns off interrupts, tells all the other CPUs to stop processing, paints the blue screen to death, Drivers can request notification of the crash, and they might want to do this if they want to shut down their hardware in a safe way. And now if a dump is configured to do so, it takes a dump. Uh, I mean, it uh, writes a dump to the disk. Now, the stop codes are also called bug check codes, and there's about 150 defined stop codes. But you're, throughout your usage of Windows, you're only likely to ever see the same handful. The two by far most common stop codes, or re really three, are Urkel not less or equal, which is usually caused by an access of an invalid memory location, or paged memory that's been paged out when the IRQL is too high. And the other two kind of go hand in hand. Invalid kernel mode trap and k-mode exception not handled. Those are usually generated by executing garbage instructions, or when the stack of the thread if executing a kernel mode becomes corrupted, and it tries to return off into la la land. Most of these stop codes are actually documented in the debugging tools help file. And you can also search Microsoft Knowledge Base for information about them. But most of the time, the stop codes and those parameters are not going to be able to help you really figure out the cause of the crash. In fact, because of the way Windows is configured by default, you might have systems in your organization that are crashing on a regular basis that you don't know about because Windows automatically reboots after it has a crash. And unless your end users happen to be there during that crash, they come back to their office after lunch or in the morning, and they think, hey, maybe a patch was applied, or maybe some group policy setting had to take place, and I was logged off the machine, and now I've got to log back in again, when in actuality, the system crashed. So one thing I recommend you do is go back and audit your event logs to look for systems that are crashing. I think you, some of you might be surprised. 
So in order to analyze a crash, you need to get the system to generate what's called the crash dump, which is a copy of some or all of physical memory. And Windows has a few different crash dump options. I'm going to switch over to the laptop to show you that dialog box. And you get to this configuration dialog box through the system applet, which I like to get through by right-clicking on my computer, going to properties, and then going to advanced, and going to startup and recovery settings. And here at the bottom is the system failure area where you configure these things like write an event to the system event log, send an administrative alert, automatically restart the machine. Down here at the bottom, you configure what kind of crash dump you want. And I'm going to pull this down so we can see the options. You can see there's four of them, and they range all the way from none to complete memory dump. Let's start with the complete memory dump. Complete memory dump was the only option available in NT4, and that causes the machine to write a full copy of physical memory to the crash dump file you specify. Its advantages are that there's no more information available to you. That is the full state of the system at the time of the crash, so it's not like you're leaving stuff out. That's the most that there is. The disadvantage of the complete memory dump is that it can be monstrously huge, right? You know, you have systems with regularly with two, three gigabytes of memory, and that's a gigantic crash dump file. You also now have commonly servers with more than four gigabytes of memory. On 32-bit systems, the largest paging file you can have is four gigs, so you can't even generate a complete memory dump on those systems. On the other extreme, you've got the small memory dump, which comes in another, it comes by a couple of other names. One is the triage dump, and another one is the mini dump. On a 30, uh, 32-bit Windows XP system, or Server 2003 system, the mini dump is 64K in size. I'm running 64-bit Windows here, XP, so it's 128K in size. On Windows Vista, it actually can vary in size, because more information can be written in there. The benefits of this, the pros of the mini dump are that it's so small, you can actually really easily send it as an email attachment off to somebody. The con, though, is that it's so small that there's, so, there's not much information there. And unless the cause of the crash is obvious in that data that was saved, you're not going to be able to figure out what happened. So kernel memory dump there, right in the middle, I think is a, a really nice compromise. Kernel memory dump is just a copy of physical memory that is owned by the operating system and the drivers, the system parts that are mapped into the system address space. You're excluding the user mode code and data. And as I explained, user mode cannot cause a problem in kernel mode. So if you're looking at analyzing the crash, all of the information you need is in kernel mode memory, including all of the data structures that are useful for analyzing the crash, like the list of processes that are active and the drivers that are loaded on the machine. Kernel, how big is a kernel memory dump? Well, it, it depends. It depends on the way that your system is using kernel memory. And on my two gigabyte laptop, when I generate a test dump, a kernel memory dump, I get somewhere in the neighborhood of 256 megabytes in size, and it's a two gigabyte laptop, like I said. But your mileage is going to vary. So what I recommend you do is configure all your systems for kernel memory dump. Now, the defaults on home and professional XP is small memory dump, and the defaults on server, if possible, is complete memory dump. So this is a change that you're going to have to go out and make. On Vista, they've changed it the default to kernel memory dump. Another advantage, by the way, that I failed to mention of the mini dump is that you get a copy of each dump file with a unique name in the mini dump directory under the Windows directory by default. So if you've got more than one crash on the same day, each one gets the name mini, date, um, month, year, dash, and index number. And it will keep those forever until you go and delete them. So you get a full history of the crashes the systems have. But that doesn't mean that you're losing that benefit with the kernel memory dump because it turns out, because of online crash analysis, which I'll talk about, that any time an XP or Server 2003 system crashes, at the reboot, no matter what you've got configured, either kernel or, or complete dump, the system will extract a mini dump out in preparation for you sending it off to Microsoft. So you get the mini dump for free when you configure a kernel dump. And these next few slides just talk about this. Let's talk about what happens when the system crashes now, and you've got it configured to write a crash dump. In that configuration dialog box, you might have noticed that you can configure the target dump file for the complete or kernel memory dump. And you know that the mini dump 